Natasha, you've had fascinating experiences with different groups of people who think in coherent but different ways. So religiously, you're brought up a Christian, you experience Buddhism and, and uh, American Indian, uh, 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 Native American um, um, religions. You've uh, been in the transhumanism movement. Uh, each of these are groups of people who believe similarly. When you try to generalize and why people believe the way they believe from in, in these group settings, uh, what kind of principles do you uh, see? The principles that I see that I, I think is shared for the most part is a love of family, a love of values, and a love of life. Now, maybe I'm fortunate because those are the experiences I've had, but maybe that's what I've been looking for, to see what that thread was, that red thread that ties humanity together, no matter what the belief system is, because it is so diverse. Being brought up an Episcopalian, I certainly went through the rituals, and I love the rituals. I love the, the Gothic, you know, cathedral look of an Episcopalian <laughs> church and the, and the windows and the choir and mm. the vestibule and the, it's just beautiful architecture and sound and mm. lighting through the, the uh, stained glass mm. windows. However, it didn't fulfill me. I felt um, in my world that I was growing up in, I felt it's another man telling me what to do because we're mostly <laughs> men at the, at the front of the church. Uh, when I left it and I went to live uh, with the Navajo Indians, for example. It was quite a change. It was quite a change. <laughs> and I lived with a, a medicine man and his wife, Robert Longsalt, very famous in Arizona on Mountaintop Reservation. He was the foremost uh, chief. So it was interesting to have that experience. And what I did experience is... Uh, a respect for nature and the environment because we were poor. We uh, had to herd the sheep and the goats and shear them and, and make our blankets. It was an exciting time. The symbols, the imagery that I noticed there, as well as in, you know, looking at pictoglyphs, uh, Lascaux, France, for example, even going to the Tutankhamun exhibition about Egyptian symbols and lore were very similar to the symbols that I noticed being used in, for example, with um, high-end filming, with high-definition filming, and with space exploration. The symbols that we use in communication, they're all circles and squares and arrows and, um, for example, the golden mean rectangle. These symbols and shapes all form a language that is universal. And it's about evolution, continental drift, evolving, learning, growing. And that, no matter what language of the environment I was in, in the different people I experienced around the world, including the Amazon jungle, there was this unity of behavior and dance and song and movement and appreciation for that, that closeness, the, the familiarity of each other. And then the love just was very obvious to me. When you look at each of these individual groups, if you look at their basic uh, beliefs, uh, many of them are directly contradictory to each other. Um, I think you're generalizing some principles that you see working in all the groups, be love, ref respect for family, certainly. Uh, but what is it that keeps the groups uh, separated? E people within those groups believe what they're thinking uh, is not just good for their family, but is the best of the world. I mean, that, yes. it, it may be, it is the true belief. Everybody else may be far or closer, but theirs is the truth. If it wasn't, if they didn't feel that way, they would, they, they'd join somebody else. So everybody feels that they have the, the real best way to do this. Precisely, and, and, and that's, and, yes, and, exactly. And, and, and why is that the case? And, and, and what, what do they have in them? Because you've been in several of these. Each group certainly is doing what? They're trying to find a resolve from death. Because ultimately, the belief system is based on being alive and protecting life mm -hmm. and giving some sort of resolve to death. There's an afterlife where you're going off someplace else with the Navajo Indians right. or returning to the underworld or going someplace to do something. Uh, the Egyptians took their ornaments with them mm -hmm. um, in the uh, sarcophagus. So it's each, each different view was about going someplace when death came. So, so that, that was a, a unifying. Great, a great mm. motivator, is what yes. you're saying. People have different ex different expressions of how they do it, but death is a motivator, and 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 how you you change that because because the human experience feels the reality of of the coming death. Yes, it's tragic. It's tragic. People die. So it seems like each culture that I've experienced around the world has had some element of resolve in their belief system, encountering the onslaught of death, the tyranny of death.
and your approach through transhumanism uh, is that if that were to mature and really work, mm -hmm. would that obviate and undermine all religion? Because now you've solved the problem in a technological sense and we don't need all the old mysticism. In a way, yes, but partially no, because I think we love rituals. <laughs> I, we love rituals. So I love going to raves. That's my type of ritual. Or, you know, going to a spa is a ritual or taking a walk uh, through the woods. Every, every group has a ritual. So I think that rituals would continue, just people living longer. Okay, but that's a big difference. Uh, that rituals can be done. You express some mm -hmm. of modern rituals, uh, but you. You won't need religion for rituals because if you've eliminated the fear of death through technology, uh, then the major under foundation of religion is is gone in your model, and, and and the only one left is ritual. But a lot of other rituals, you don't need the religion. Let me say, I'm not a religious person, but I can see where religion would adapt. You think of the Catholic Church, for example, who certainly has adapted to the changing times. We think about specific religions that have been harbored by certain uh, parameters of what is right and wrong, not in the value system, but as far as what's natural, what's considered okay for society, mm -hmm. they change over time, mm -hmm. they adapt. So I could see where religion could adapt and love life. Yeah, I think that's right. And in most cases, that, that that's true. But we're, we're now hypothesizing <laughs> right. that we can eliminate death. And if you could eliminate death, what would that do to a religion? I think that's a different kind of character. And here's my answer to that. I don't, I don't believe in immortality. That's my belief. I think immortality is an old world hope and dream that is implausible and impractical. So you the, just want to extend life? Extend life. Um, I use the phrase unlimited lifespan or radical life extension. We don't know what's going to happen. Our universe has a time clock. Sure. So it's, you know, it'd be a little bit ridiculous to say we're going to do away with death completely. We don't know what the future holds. So then religion is safe. <laughs> for, a t for a while yet. <laughs> Maybe so. Spirituality certainly is safe.